All right, welcome back, everybody. We're having a... We need to get this podcast out sooner than probably the other ones because this is just one of the really requested ones. And I told... Uh, Travis is here with me. Um, Hello. Who is... Uh, we're going to be having a conversation today about Calvinism, sort of. Um, it's going to just be a discussion. The reason why we're doing this is because... Um, this is basically for our my, our church, uh, our online church. We've had a lot of questions on what it is, and uh, you know what what's the difference between this and and what we dispensationalism. Which these terms, we promise you that we're gonna we're gonna talk in the most simple terms that we know how. And I'm gonna try to remember to simply explain every term that we use. So so this is gonna this is not gonna be like a you know a huge breakdown we understand that this is for people that really don't understand what these terms are but they keep hearing them from these uh different churches and, and different people and they they keep getting forced into to a box into a belief and and asking these questions so while we're we're going to be talking kind of specifically and simply because this is for our church group we thought this would be a good podcast to throw out there too just to just to have a conversation out there about it um like I said, Travis is here with me. Uh, we're just going to, I'm not really going to lead a whole up uh, into our positions on it because I think our positions as we, as we talk about this will just kind of unfold and people will be able to kind of pick that out themselves. Um, we, we definitely, um, I describe myself as a, a, in a full dispensationalist. Okay. When we say dispensationalist, we are, you know what? I had something pulled up here, right here. This is the perfect little little write-up that somebody else did so I don't have to sit here and stumble over my words. All right, so this, uh, this doctrinal statement here says it perfectly. We believe that the Bible presents the fact that God has not always dealt with mankind the same way in every age. According to biblical terminology, these distinct periods are called administrations in regard to the purpose of God or stewardships concerning the responsibility of man as originated from the New Testament usage of the Greek word. Pronounce that word for me, Travis. Oh. Uh, oikonomia. Yeah, that's right. Sorry, I was muted. O oikonom oikonomia. oikonomia. We believe that classical or traditional dispensationalism is the system that represents the biblical teaching on this matter. Classical or traditional dispensationalism is distinguished by a consistent, literal interpretation, a clear distinction between Israel and the church. That's the main, main important point of dispensationalism there. Taking into account progressive revelation, recognizing that the glory of God as the ultimate purpose of God in the word. And they have Ephesians 1.10 and then 3.2 and 9 listed on that. Um which obviously just for sim if you if you didn't know what I just read, you're still confused. Um, the simplest I can put this is most I guess most in, and if you've got a better interpretation or way to say this, correct me. but I guess most teachers will teach what we call, replacement theology just because that that which replaces, the church with Israel. Right. And that's, yeah. And it, and most teachers don't make the distinction between the church and Israel. So, and this is our, and so what majority, what comes from the pulpit that you're going to hear is not going to be that distinction. You're not going to hear the distinction between Israel and the church. Um, and that's not, it's, it's innocently done, I think, in many cases, but it's just, and we still do hear it like you do. I mean, you go through, you go to a Calvary Chapel church, um, Calvary Chapel, and there are churches that do it. John MacArthur with Grace, you know, they do. Um, but largely, I think a lot of the mega churches, um, the Catholic, you know, coming from the Catholic church, the Reformed church, um, the Reformed churches um, that came off of that kind of held to that that replacement uh, theology where we're, we're, we're kind of getting rid of Israel, so to speak, and, and saying that God's promises to Old Testament, the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, are no longer, those are null and void, and now the, those were realized in the church. Um, so that's the, that's the, the biggest distinction between those two. Um, and then 
Calvinism or Reform theology, whatever whatever you want to call it, um, the 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 main idea around Reform theology is that the church has replaced Israel. That that's what they it's it's also known as covenant theology. That the the church has all the they spiritualize all of the Old Testament verses and they they turn them into a a fulfillment in in the church in the New Testament. Right, and I'd say that a lot of that comes from like like you're saying, both the Catholic Church and the Reformers mm-hmm. held to that replacement theology because there was a uh, I guess a a hatred that kind of grew out of the 16th century uh, for the Jews, right. um, and it was you know not you know at that time not having the nation of Israel around you know them having been essentially essentially dispersed throughout the nations right mm-hmm. therefore in a way they they saw no they could not reconcile the idea that god promised he was going to bring them back together and so there was this like okay well we've fully replaced the jews that's kind of where that came about like martin luther was guilty of that in his later years uh and even those the from the catholic side that argued against him um you know, that they essentially both were in agreement on that point where it's like, well, this is all because of the Jews. So that's where I think this replacement theology came about. And it's also why it's so dangerous because, yeah, we, we recognize that those promises were made to Israel as a nation. And although we can recognize, like it says, not, uh, not all Israel is Israel, those promises were to those who believed in faith. Correct. Right. So you have to kind of hold all that together. Hey, we being Gentiles coming to faith in Christ, we are grafted in, but we have not replaced Israel. And there's a greater fulfillment of Israel. Christ is coming back. He's coming to Jerusalem. Correct. Right. To the correct, nation. Literal, correct. Right. Uh, and he even says, you know, for when he came and he <coughs> told them that the work was going to be, it was going to begin in Jerusalem, mm-hmm. then Samaria, and then ultimately spread to the, you know, the rest of the world. So... Yeah, from that aspect, um, that was one of the points that, that Calvinists tend to hold. John Calvin being, you know, a reformer following after Martin Luther, uh, roughly 50 years. I can't remember exact dates. Um, but, yeah, and that's, you got to remember, too, a lot of them still held to Catholic-esque, you know, um, doctrines. They, they, they still were, they hadn't fully severed, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's... That's part of where that is. Yeah, and then, you know, the, the other point that I wanted to point out, too, is thinking about when a lot of us started, even, let's even take it, remind it back further to, you know, we can look at the epistles and we can see that in Paul's ministry, mostly he was dealing with this infiltration of Jewish, the the, Judaiz, the Judaizers that were trying to Judaize the church. Okay, so, but that kind of subsided around 70 A.D., after the destruction of the temple and the dispersion of the Jews, that kind of that that issue kind of solved itself with them being kind of dispersed out into the land. So by the time that we had the epistles like that John wrote later on after that they were written probably in the 80s or 90s AD that John wrote his letters, the problem that was coming into the church was way less Jewish and it was way more greek gentile this spiritualization of this this gnostic kind of view right. of this um but move that that wanted to knock the divinity of christ down and wanted to completely remove the jew out of the out of the whole of the whole picture and wanted to and completely downgrade and, and that Christ's saving work was now through through this and no longer with with the jews so we see that in the first century even starting. So you see this kind of gaining traction, which, yeah, I mean, it would hard in the first century, it would be really hard to not kind of understand it that way. But we also see, like Paul writing too, that, hey, we can't, you had mentioned the, the, the verse about, you know, Israel, the Israel of God. Nobody, you know, it's also in that whole, that's what that whole middle section of Romans is exactly about this whole process of Israel. It's saying God has not forgot his chosen covenant people. I mean, he, by no means he hasn't. He explains this whole thing how, you know, look, you're not Gentile. You're not the root of the tree. You're, you're definitely part of it, but you're not the root and the root will never be destroyed no matter what. And if we, if we say that, that puts 
our salvation in jeopardy because what has Israel done that we haven't done? I mean, absolutely nothing. There's nothing that the nation of Israel does that we haven't done. Oh, what? They, they rejected and, and killed. We reject the Messiah all the time. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, we don't necessarily have the, his blood on our hands as, as the nation, you know, that generation of Israel did. But, um, w you know, we, we, we practice the same things in disobedience to him and to ignoring him. It doesn't matter whether or not blood's on our hands or not. It's still, it's the same offense. So... That's one thing that, um, that that even goes all the way back to there that I really just, that's my only really kind of hang up on this. Um, but those are, I think those are just like two of the, 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 the biggest difference in between what it is. Um, I, I think these little, we can go just over the basic points of like what Calvinism is. Um, right, because, and, that, and, and I think that's the misconception is that there's, there's actually categories Correct. that, that kind of fall under this. Um, and really, even just titling it Calvinism is, you know, in many ways, it's like saying a bad word. So right. A lot of people don't really understand the different aspects. So there's the soteriology portion of it. That is the doctrines of grace, the, the things that talk about God's work in salvation. Okay. You've got those points. Then you've got, like I said, the pedo baptism side where Calvin mm. held to that. Okay, you've, uh, and then you've also got, like we just discussed, the dispensational versus their more amillennial mm -hmm. viewpoint that would have stemmed through Calvin and, and his followers. So, um, so yeah, when, whenever you hear that term, it, it can bring about confusion because, well, what, what, what are you talking about? And I would mm -hmm. say a lot of, a lot of the uh, New Age Calvinists really haven't even considered the... Uh, I guess the eschatology, the end times portion of it, they more focus on the salvific doctrines, Correct. right? Um, so that's where, you know, somebody may say they're, you know, Calvinistic or something, and then only be talking about the, sal the, the, the doctrines of grace, the salvation portion. So, But um, what's really, and, and one thing that I wanted to point it out too, though, a, another large difference in between these two, though, is how you understand a lot of these aren't these aren't salvation issues but this is how you under some of them are not but how you understand the gospel in in what's going on in the world right now is very important so like where even though the eschatology is off and you're like okay and this is why john MacArthur is kind of puzzling because it's like your 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 eschatology is there and you hold this literal interpretation like we were just talking about to israel and the difference between that but then we go and we take back say for matthew because this is a complete dispensational breakdown of the book of matthew is there's there's quite a few differences in matthew from MacArthur's interpretation to a, a dispensationalist interpretation to it because of Jesus who he's speaking to he's speaking to the Jews speaking of the kingdom that was being offered to the Jews so we're like that for instance you where MacArthur understands the um, the, the the widow's mites that's a correct dispensation no understanding of that of that story right because we would say that this is over a correct they would interpret this saying this is a corrupt religious system this isn't what we read on the surface of thinking this widow just gave all of her money to you know because she was nice and wanted to be good to jesus you know like no that's that, that's not the case this this goes way deeper into that so he interprets that like that but he'll go and take for instance and like the parables, Matthew, the Matthew 13 parables. Okay, so a dispensationalist completely interprets the parable of the mustard seed different than what a covenant theologian would. Because the parable, we wouldn't interpret these, these parables as thinking like leaven. We don't go, okay, well, everywhere else that's bad, but except for in this one spot, it's good. When especially all the other parables leading up to this, Jesus was talking about how the gospel wasn't going to be received and how there was only going to be certain people that received it. So as a dispensational understanding to like the parable of the mustard seed would be 
Jesus is talking about this huge false religious system that's being built because a mustard is a mustard tree is not a big great tree where birds can you know there it, it's this is one thing that we're gonna we're gonna have to go over but this is where um this this understanding doesn't really make a lot of sense in like the leakiness because we're we're believing that that Jesus is describing this period between the two advents. Okay, and if we look at Second Timothy, we believe that right before the the end of the you know the end of this age, right before the return of Christ, that we're going to be dealing with general apostasy in a church that's just absolutely not where it, it needs to be. So if we're thinking that the church is going to grow, and if we're interpreting that that it's going to grow into this big, beautiful, powerful, wonderful, perfect, good thing, you know, that's going to move then that's like that's where that interpretation is like well i mean it's it's really hard to make it say that if you're going to say that this uh, jesus kingdom is not of this world we are not talking about this we're talking about future kingdom promises we're not talking about this kingdom here and now so that's where that and he explains it oh i mean macarthur explains it okay i don't i don't necessarily agree with it but that is a huge difference in where those two things meet. So that's where like his stuff is like, okay, so you interpret this one way, but you don't interpret these, this, this way, especially in a gospel like Matthew that, you know, I mean, it's obviously like, you know, it's a very Jewish gospel. Absolutely. So essentially you're, you're pointing out that there's, there's, there's a, right. There's just a, there's a difference in that and an inconsistency in that. I think in between those two, not saying that um, that's just pointing that out where that's where it's like we can that's where it's like you, you want to be reformed, but it's really, really hard when you get talking about the kingdom and Jesus teaching when he's referring to the kingdom. So that's where it's like that's like what's the word for it? I'm looking. There's a word for it. I'm thinking of influence. I don't know. If no, that's it's not influence. Uh, but um, uh I don't I don't know. I, I'm not going to try to sound smart, but <laughs> I already did that. But um, this is where where this is like, OK, this is where it's like you're either a dispensationalist or what? Like what? What do you think on that? Because that's like you have to either say that, yes, there is a sense and we all agree that there's a sense of. Okay, the, there's a, there's a form of the kingdom. We know that we can. The kingdom is growing, um, but our our operation in that and our tool, I guess, is the where the dispensational and the and the reform differences come in. Because while we agree that there is there was a sense of a kingdom that existed, it's our involvement on 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 that growing and building it and interpreting Jesus' words as instructions as opposed to teaching i guess so essentially what you're getting at is like the amillennial view believes that the mustard seed is uh us building the kingdom it's gonna grow it's here and now correct in that consistent and it's <coughs> therefore there's no need for the thousand year millennium correct right? now right. um yeah and, and i get what you're saying because john MacArthur, i think interprets that passage if i remember correctly where he is talking about the influence of the gospel going into the nations. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where you would say that that kind of follows along with that. Um, but then even then, we know that even the, the preaching of the gospel is not going to be recepted, like accepted in a large scale. I mean, it, it is where a dispensationalist would say that Jesus said that that's few are find the way, not many, few. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't interpret that as the way that Jesus said Okay, well, it's going to to grow in a huge, you know, that the amillennial view of saying that it's going to grow in that larger way. So where a dispensationalist would say, okay, but th that that's not, you know, that's well, not I, was it I, view that. I mean, it's probably important at least to recognize that uh, the Jesus's ministry was confined to Israel. Correct. He, if you remember when he was, I think around Tyre or something, the the one woman saying that her daughter is demon possessed and she kept basically right. hanging him, son of David, please heal my daughter. And he tells her, Hey, I've come to the nation of Israel. Yeah. Right. But right. he still ends up granting sure. her, her prayer and uh, healing her daughter. Um, but the focus was on there on Israel at the time. 
They rejected their sure. Messiah, and therefore um, God still used essentially the dispersion for the gospel to go forth. And it does, I mean... And to clear that up, that dispensationalist says that that, that, occur, that the rejection fully occurred when he, when he died, is when, that, when the rejection was, was... Right, they chanted literally... Correct. Um, we have no king but Caesar. Exactly, and that's uh, the and moment... And his blood be upon us and our children. And that's the dispensational moment that says, okay, <laughs> this is your rejection of this, and this is that moment. So that would mean that all the teachings leading up to that, though, were still for the, the kingdom of Israel, not... Not for us not to, obviously, we can learn from, we, but we can't take this in a way say, saying that Jesus was speaking to us in the way of directly to us, where he was speaking to the nation of Israel and speaking of his second coming, where we still, you know, we still have, there, that still doesn't mean that, like, like MacArthur does incorrectly say that dispensations that his one problem with dispensationalism is when they say that the sermon amount the sermon on the mount isn't for the church today and it's like that that's not that's an unfair that's an unfair comparison to say that a, a full dispensationalist says that the sermon on the mount is not it's i, I mean it's 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 not for the church today, but that doesn't mean that it's not for us. Like, it, 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 was that who Jesus' audience was speaking to? Was that who he was? Absolutely, no. We the the church wasn't in view here. That, that's it wasn't. This was Israel. So, but that does not mean uh, we can go back to the conversation we were just having before this with Romans nine, knowing that we are grafted into these promises. So that's where you're like, okay, yeah. I mean, this this does fit me but i'm kind of like the kid like standing in the background watching the the other younger you know the older kid get in trouble you know while i'm going ooh, man <laughs> he's getting it like i'm just <laughs> gonna sit back here and i'm gonna relax for a minute while this goes on you know it, but that was what that's what the that's what the kingdom promise was that's what that's what everybody that's what the offer was and that was what this kingdom postponement was saying okay fine I, because you rejected it, that does not mean that I'm through forever and all of a sudden this is plan B and now this is the new plan. It's like, no, that was, it was postponed. Like the, the middle town has like the, the example of like a picnic, right? Weather permitting. So we're having a picnic today. It's going to be at 630 weather, per, weather permitting. But if it's raining, it's going to be at 7. So does that mean that it's not going to happen? No, it's just going to happen later. So it was postponed. The same event's going to happen. It was just postponed. So it was, it was the same thing with, with Israel where this, this was like, okay, well, this kingdom is going to, I'm going to deal with the church and this time in between these two advents and then go back dealing to the nation of Israel. And I think that, w I don't remember where I was going with that. You <laughs> might. Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just recognizing that, um, you know, when we understand Scripture, it needs to be held in context. What did it mean to those people at that time? And then how do right. we apply it to us with that proper understanding? Right. Um, so, right. Yeah, it was not a permanent setting aside. Now, just as Romans 9 says, it, he, Paul, when he's writing there, he recognizes, look, there was a partial hardening of Israel sure. for the purpose of the Messiah who needed to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was through that, and God allowed this at that time for that purpose, right? Um, but he's not done with them. Correct. Uh, and you can think of many times before where God turns them over to their enemies for a short period. Mm -hmm. uh, now, yeah, we're talking 2,000 years, but again, just like the Reformers at, you know, around the time of Calvin, they, didn't, they never saw that to its full extent. They never saw the nation coming back, the people coming back from these nations, forming Israel once again, right? Which is really leading up to, per, you know, fulfilling a lot of these other um, prophecies that are coming about. And so... Well, you know what? I saw another, I saw another comparison of this because I had a question earlier this week about Job. 
They said, okay, well, if Job, the question was, if Job was in chronological, this was from the 21-day challenge you were doing. Sorry, Alexis is here, too, even though she's not talking. I'm talking to her. <laughs> and so, like, and if, if you know, in our church, we've been, uh, Alexis started this 21-day challenge thing where it's, I'm not going to go fully into it, but um, it was re- bu- reading Bible books. And, and, chrono- and one of our members decided to do it in chronological order, and she did G- Genesis and Job. And she goes, okay, wait a minute. If Job was in where, if Job was somewhere in between Abraham or before Abraham, how how does this work? How does this like what? And I was like, that's exactly it. Is it before the promise? There was there was this is another foreshadowing of exactly what's happening right now. Is before God went and dealt and had the re dealt with this covenant with the Jews again because the original plan was in the garden, right? When they got kicked out of the garden, right? So this was gone and dealt with the the Gentiles before the covenant was made. And I'm like that you can see that all the way back in, in Genesis. But I answered that question with, cause she wasn't, she couldn't understand how this was, this was working. If it was, it was before the covenant. So she goes, does that mean that Job wasn't one of God's people because he wasn't part of the covenant people of, of Abraham or he didn't come after Abraham. And I was like, or that's or I mean before the 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 law was given I slipped up before the law was given and that's even um no it was during that whole period of time no the 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 Lord was was there and uh she was just kind of like mind blown by that she was just like wow I didn't even I've never even thought about that before and I was like yeah it's exactly like to the way that it is now <clears throat> yeah so that's that would be the obviously the the whole um I guess eschatology yeah. points, right? Um, so maybe we'll, we'll touch upon, like, what is it, the, the other aspect, the, the salvation points. Um, so we can give a general overview of what those are, at least from a, a definitional standpoint, um, because I think that's where a lot of people get confused as well. Um, so uh, having kind of looked into this quite a bit, and yeah, uh, there's, you know, you'll find, I guess, spectrums, over over these five points and really the five points are like i said soteriology is the technical term that's the study of salvation right mm-hmm. uh, or literally how how does god's salvific work come about and uh <coughs> unfortunately i think a lot of times it, it falls into uh, a lot of people argue philosophically mm-hmm. um you know we want to get back to the text but the the five points that are fall under the term calvinist or calvinism uh, is through the acronym TULIP. Mm-hmm. So you have total depravity. That's the T. You have um, unconditional election, if I remember correctly. Um, that is the U. L is limited atonement. Mm-hmm. I is irresistible grace. And P is uh, perseverance of the saints. And now Calvin did not actually create these. So I think that's correct. <laughs> here, no, this came about later on. You know, Calvin, by age 22, wrote his, if I remember correctly, wrote the uh, uh, Institutes of Christianity, or, or Calvin's Institutes as it's known, um, this huge volume, multi-volume ba- book, basically on uh, just all aspects doctrine of Christianity. Um, and so if you glean from what he essentially wrote about and what he understood, that's where these five points kind of came about. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think they had actually been written down for minimally 50 more years. After yeah. Or something yeah. Like he gets, he gets very unfairly attributed for these points. Cause now these were not, these definitely were not from him. And Cal, like Calvin didn't even agree with all these points completely. So the, <laughs> well, yeah, so the yeah. way they're, they're described the now, they're described, uh, there's a question whether yeah. he, he fully held to each yeah, one. Yeah. I mean, not all of them because these can't, yeah, these came long before him. So, um, I guess just simply going over the first one of um, just what these are. So people, we get the question all the time of what these are, what does this mean, what, what is this all about? So um, T being total depravity. T, the first one being total depravity, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, total depravity, you go ahead and you can give a short explanation to our word. Um, total depravity, total essentially depravity. the idea is that uh, mankind is so depraved, if you want to call it that, uh, in the sense of they cannot by their own volition choose to love God or choose God in that sense. So that's the total depravity portion. 
I love how he says, in that sense. That's an important distinction to make between extreme Calvinism, <laughs> because a lot of times some uh, will, but um, to go over. But um, yeah, we definitely, we are completely depraved. We cannot, we cannot and have absolutely zero to offer God. Um, to uh, We cannot have any saving faith without Christ. We are completely depraved. In it. We are a natural enemy of God in the flesh. And of course, there's there's spectrums too. Like, sure. Um, somebody who'd hold to the five points would point out things like we are slaves to sin, and so then you also have the other ones where it's like, okay, well, yeah, we're depraved. We need Christ. We need His grace, uh, but we still choose God. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of levels of that, right? So sure. e even within that, there are uh, spectrums that can kind of come about. How, where do you hold? How exactly depraved are we? Um, and even some yes, of the modern Yes, because, features. right, because the extreme depraved would be they could, and this is, a, this is a piece of the, con I guess we can have a little bit of this now, but how depraved that is, like, some teach and believe that you cannot come absolutely, and I guess this is irresistible grace, too, part of it is that you absolutely cannot come to any kind of saving faith in Christ without faith being a gift from god that's what some teach i'm well, not saying that's, that's what these, i personally hold to but go ahead right and that's 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 kind of where these kind of play in is um a lot of times when you isolate it that's where it's hard to distinguish because really they play together right um so they maybe, do yeah right. so maybe well, i'll give a full definition of all of them so okay you have yeah. total depravity um unconditional election basically that what that is saying is um there is no condition by which god chooses us uh, it was unconditional, right? Mm -hmm. So somebody didn't earn it over somebody else. That's where the unconditional election comes from. Um, limited atonement, that is on the basis of the uh, for whom did Christ die, I guess would be the general term. But is it literally every single person, past, present, and future? Or is it a specific people? That's it, so because, the, the, right, right. because the reform view does hold to that that elect was the ch the 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 uh, saints of all time right like you said if if who um who exactly that is if it's if it's just like one one group of all time or whatever right and it, and it comes to how do you define terms like world things like that but correct um but yeah that limited atonement the the calvinist side would say uh no he died for a particular elect people um not right. everyone of the whole world uh and then uh, irresistible grace, like kind of like what you said, that's the, the form where uh, if God is meaning to call you, you will not be able to resist his grace. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the definition. Of that. And then perseverance of the saints is if you are Luke. truly a saint, if you're truly saved, essentially, um, you will persevere to the end. Therefore, you will, like, you can't... Cannot lose your salvation. Cannot lose your salvation, right. And again, there's even variance on that. Um, right. You know, I, I've heard some people hold to that, and what they'll say is, yeah, absolutely, God will never let you go, um, but you can choose to walk away. Like, which just seems kind of strange to me. It's like, okay, I don't know if you really hold to that viewpoint or not. Uh, but there's different, you know, again, this is where... Um, having to define these properly and biblically would be important. How does this all harmonize? Where, where then do you hold to this? And again, looking at this, this is all aspects of trying to define God's work in salvation. Right. right. And these are all just biblical principles, guys. These are just, I mean, people get so confused off of these. Like, what is this? These are just ideas in scripture of you know just just systems um that it's nothing that's that's that we go outside of scripture for or anything else these these writings of calvin and everything else you know these studies were something um you know that were they were all biblically based so that being said i guess we already talked about total depravity unconditional election that one we you, you hit on that one a little bit i think me personally on that one, I really hate this, this discussion. I really do. I think it is the most insane, ridiculous discussion ever because, you know, I, I, I think it's clear and I think we both agree on that, of course, God desired every man 
to be saved. However, that's just not going to be the case. That's not whether and, and whether or not who those who though the identity of those are is where this argument begins and and gets out of control. And it's you know the, it, extremism turns it to the point that God's just sitting up there. He's got a board going. Okay, I want Bill, but I don't want Bob. You know, like like Tommy. Like like he's sitting there splitting these two people and and destining people. You know what? Uh, this team goes to hell and this team goes to heaven. It's like this is what we they dumb this down to, and that's what really I, I really caution anybody that's involved in any kind of church or teacher that definitely tries to do you know do that especially with this i mean there's certainly there's 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 you know these systems are in place for a reason and, and these ideas and the you know are, are there for a reason but i think um people tend to abuse them and, and can just turn and they can make themselves some sort of you know membership club that you know you might get into but you never know if you you will or not for sure and that's when that gets very dangerous and you have to be careful with it. And, and I don't know that that's, I don't, I don't know that. I think most of the time it's misunderstood rather than people trying to be malicious with it. I don't think anybody's trying to sit there. I, I don't know one Calvinist that really believes that God sat up there with this whiteboard and believe that, you know what, he's going to hell. And that's just, but um, that's definitely the charge that it gets a lot. And I don't agree with that, I, you know, against it at all. Do you have a thought on that one? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's so many points to cover, and that's why it always comes back to, uh, you know, not letting it become a, a philosophical argument, but taking Scripture as a whole. Um, because that's where I think a lot of these fights come along, is Christians are unable to sit down and actually, like, properly open the Scripture and say, okay, let's discuss this. Let's read over these passages. Um, because like what you, you, you mentioned, God desires all men everywhere to be saved. Um, second Peter three, nine, if I have that memorized, mm -hmm. right. The, you know, uh, the, um, RC Sproul argument was, okay, well, God's will there is defined in two different ways. You have his, um, his desire type will, and then you have his, his, what's going to come may pass will whatever i de determine is going to happen there's those two different wills so which one is that talking about so some will argue that others would argue okay well, no um is he talking about all men as in every single person past present and future or is he saying all men as in every single people group right not just the jews mm -hmm. or as some would argue no he's talking about every single person so that's where right you know, and that's where and that's where um people like on the i guess the more dispensational side or the more however you want to call it side of it would be that yes he means man like all mankind that would be that that's what they would identify that is saying yes all mankind to be saved but that's clearly not the case so that's when you get into the well right if if so that's where you like you would say if he is literally desiring all men why then do they not that's what would bring about okay is it because of man's free choice free will mm -hmm. right this is where this goes into that's, that leads into the next point people that he chose right right so you see how this argument can can very quickly um, essentially go off the rails because sure. a lot of times we don't define terms and so when we when one person says one thing and another person says another referencing the same either verse or same word they may be applying two different meanings right right so that's where uh, a lot of these arguments come from is many times it's one-sided right uh you have somebody <clears throat> holding to their viewpoint and they will give all their you know uh proof texts They'll, they'll sit down and say, I, th these verses here explain what I believe and why I believe it, and you're wrong because you missed these verses. Right. And then the other side, because they're not talking with each other, they're not actually discussing this, the other side goes, well, I have my verses here, 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 and you need to answer to these, and then you end up getting this just pointing finger you know, argument where, okay, have you guys sat down? Have you gone through and walked through the text? Does it hold up? Does this harmonize with all of Scripture? And so... Yeah, that's a lot to take in. And mm -hmm. that's why, um, in the end, 
we should all recognize that it is by God's grace alone that we are saved mm -hmm. through faith alone. Right. Now, how does that faith come about? Okay, some would argue, okay, God must grant it. Others say, no, you know, it comes about, you, you choose in your choosing, right? Right. So there's so many whoever right. <laughs> yeah there's so many aspects to this there there is so. and I, it, it divides a lot of Christians and it shouldn't and I think that was a, one of right. the points too is why that the people get so caught up in this you're like okay you say that you're this way and this way and this way but you listen to so and so and so and so it's like well yes I mean we all we all agree that that Jesus Christ is exactly who he said he was and <clears throat> that one day or another we're all going to be in the same place you know and so that's like I, on John MacArthur's uh, night of eschatology that he did with Sam Storms and all, and Doug Wilson and all those guys the end of it that's how he starts the beginning of it he's like all right so we all believe that Jesus Christ is exactly who he says he was that he is going to return one day whenever this is someday right I go, yep. He goes, all right, we're done. <laughs> like, yeah. we're done here. You so, John MacArthur, it was John Piper. Or I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. John Piper. Uh, but yeah, um, I, I, night, and I watched the evening that. of eschatology. Yeah. yeah, and it was interesting. And yeah. you could tell, even at times, even in those conversations, they get kind of. Oh, yeah, they get very heated. heated. And they're like, oh, what about this verse? Heated. you got to explain it. And it's like, okay, well. Sam Storm, well, see, Sam Storms is an anomaly to me because he, he started off premillennial and then he went on millennial. I'm like, how do you do that? That that is. Yeah. Well, I think RC wow. Sproul kind of went that way too. Well, the RC did, and then of course Jeff Durbin that we talk about from Apologia. That's a that's what he did. But only True. he didn't go on millennial. He went post millennial because him and <laughs> him and Doug now are <laughs> which, BFFs. Which yeah. Doug is just. I mean, yeah. I felt bad for Doug. Most people really liked his his thing on that, but I felt bad for Doug in that because I didn't feel like he gave a great. Um, uh, 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 well, presentation I think he felt of like the odd man theology. out. Yeah, and. It, he looked really nervous. Well, yeah, he, he, did. And, he and, did. But you should try and explain post-millennial theology. It sounds ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and even I think John Piper, to kind of ease the, the <laughs> argument, was like, listen, there are gaps in every single one of these viewpoints that somebody's going to try and point out and, you know, we may not have a perfect explanation of. Um, and that's kind of what goes back to these points of soteriology is essentially somebody's going to try and point out a gap and it, you... It takes a while to harmonize everything together and to build your viewpoint. Now, where, like you said, but we can recognize where teachers will hold to certain levels of this. Mm. Like you said, I sit under Calvary Chapel. They mm. would define themselves as kind of a mid-level three point, right. I guess, of the five. And that's where even they kind of sway between two and three points based on how they would explain it. Um, but I can glean from their teachings. I recognize they teach verse by verse, which mm -hmm. is like what we do. Um, because it's really hard to go off the rails when you follow verse by verse and you have to pay attention to what does the context say. Um, and so that's where, uh, you know, we would recommend anybody don't, if you, if it is not a primary issue, okay? Right. Like if what we're both saying is we're both clinging to Christ for salvation, Absolutely. right? Amen. Um, by God's grace, hey, that is it. That is the only reason I am saved. Whether I, I personally made the decision or God made it for me, however you want to define it, we can agree that it is through Christ. And so with that point, we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and therefore we should be working together, right? Uh, we should be uh, in com communion, I guess would be the term. Yeah. Okay. Community. Community. Right. Um, communion, yeah. Because we are fellow workers of the gospel. Now, again, that's where some people will argue, well, you, how do you... Um, how do you give the gospel, right? Because somebody who holds the five points, you know, they're going to say, okay, well, how would I define God's love? Mm -hmm. As opposed to somebody who says, well, no, it's free will. Therefore, somebody, you know, um, God's love is the same across the board at all points, just like you, you said, all right, Second Peter 3, 9, you're talking about God desires all men to be saved. If you hold that to every single person, well, then God is loving in his act Therefore, to be harmonious with that, the atonement must have been unlimited. The, like, right. you see how it all comes together. And that's what, that's what I love how Paul Washer actually distinguishes that, though, is because he was saying that, you know, God, there was that loving act, like the propitiation for that wasn't, <laughs> that didn't make him loving. It made him just. It made him consistent with who he is. 
So that that atonement with that being because we as human flesh when we fell, we human mankind fell. So you know, like when when Paul Washer was putting it that way, he was like, that is, yeah, I mean, that makes that atonement has to be for everybody. I mean, that, I mean, that has to be for mankind, and it, I mean, regardless, like you said, however we, whatever group we apply that to, or, or however that works, that's just that's where it gets a little, a little confusing because you're like. God's love and, and 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 how we apply that, but then, you know that 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 atoning sacrifice of how that's applied is no no question at all because that just had to be done. Period, just to justify who God was. I mean, because he can't he he can't be he can't be just and not punish you for your sin. So Christ had to be had to suffer that punishment. That's also where that. Well, I guess that's another doctrine. <laughs> it's gonna go into a whole different doctrine of of the the people that don't actually believe that he suffered, that he suffered the wrath of God. That and which is that's another new, um, right? That's coming about teaching, is teaching. So, um, I, I mean, even the JWs would hold to that. Where oh, well, God is so loving, He would have never punished His Son. So right. what Jesus did was just to essentially complete a life, to therefore, um, you know, suffering under Romans. Uh, his life was still perfect, therefore he now gives us a chance, essentially. Um, so yeah, that would be the fully heretical view. Um, right. But it's yeah. Th- but that's the thing is, it, that's why I said in the beginning this this tends to become philosophical, mm-hmm. because you start sure. considering if this then this, if this sure. then this, and it becomes this system, right? And you can't that's, play that. They, you tur- it turns into a Pharisee system, right? And that's why you know those those of the Calvary Chapel movement um, tend to go well. We just recognize God's sovereignty and we recognize man's uh, free will. <laughs> and it's like um, two railroad tracks that, you know, just go off and into the distance. Eventually, somehow it comes together, but you don't see it. And so it's like, OK, well, even that's a philosophical argument. But but it is. It's can you harmonize this viewpoint with text? Does it apply to everything that you read? And then how does it apply? Because even like you said, there are. This is where I've heard some things where um, they'll say, okay, well, Jesus died for all people. God wants everyone to be saved. Therefore, those who have not heard the gospel, well, they're saved then. It's like, ooh, that's oh, that's, that's Billy. Yeah, that's that. That's right, because I've heard that. That's that Billy Graham. That even that where it's like, what if they haven't heard the gospel, but like God knows their heart, right? Type and it's, thing, argument where that. That's that's where you get into a, a, an interesting discussion right. with that because that's what do you do on that? But then you answer that very simply. You go, okay, well, that the the number of people though like that 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 have not heard or have not been able to receive that is is a very small number to begin with. Yeah, well, I mean, and that's where, like I said, harmonization of the text. So somebody who I actually had a conversation with about that, I said, okay, well, hold on, have you read Romans one and Romans three? Romans 1 where it talks about the unrighteousness uh, <coughs> is or the wrath of God is being poured out upon all the unrighteousness right. of men right. who wa- they reject God. right? right. They don't reject give God. honor right. and glory to God and they make gods of their own creation. I said, what do those pygmies do? They do exactly that. They're right. already following it. And that's where the total depravity part comes from is they we realize that we are born into sin. And that's why even some who would not hold to that point would say, okay, no, 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 we're Essentially, born innocent, mm-hmm. right? Okay, can you can you prove that scripturally? Yeah, right? no. Yeah. So that's where again, it's it's taking the text, understanding how does this all flow together. It does end up becoming a system, but we we always want to caution with <laughs> using that term system like systematic theology. System, yeah, exactly. Right? Um, you know, you should be able to harmonize all the scriptures, and I'm not speaking against a like a specific form of systematic theology, but that's why you have multi-volume different systematic theologies that don't agree exactly. with one another because again it's they are holding certain viewpoints over others and yeah we come with traditions too right sure we have uh everybody essentially grew up with a, a form of tradition in the sense of coming to christianity mm-hmm. some who were outside of it right you know we grew up in the church essentially right um so i already had preconceptions of like okay jesus died for all hey that's what i was taught right and so there are those points where 
we all come to these arguments essentially biased already, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so there's a danger in not recognizing that you have um, those traditions built into your thinking, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because as we grow in the knowledge of Christ and through Scripture, I think there 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 should be just a little bit of understanding where, hey, I probably don't have everything right. Oh right? yeah, sure. We even as teachers we want to dive into the word and we should be able to back up what we say with scripture. Um, But we should be willing to consider a biblically defined argument, right? Sure. And so I think if you don't have that, you know, you don't have reconsiderations in your head of certain smaller things that there's something wrong because you, we can't have it all. There's, there's, it's impossible for us to have it completely, you know, a hundred percent in the way of, of knowledge of God, obviously not, you know, his word. That's, that's where we're easy. We, we, there's the other side of this where we play ignorant too much and go, well, it cannot be understood. You know, like, um, it was it Calvin or Edwards that, that wrote on the, the commentary for revelation that was like, nope, cannot be understood. Cannot. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, no, it doesn't work oh, like that. It's knows. like the revelation, the final unveiling, you know, it's, it, we understand this now. But, um, you know, the other side of that would be like, you know, oh, like, there's no way we can grasp it. It's like, okay, well, there's, there's, we, we can grasp his word. We, we can't grasp every single little concept, and it's not like we're going to be majorly off on some. I mean, yes, on these little minor issues like we're talking about. But, I mean, honestly, the biggest, and I think the biggest difference between the two, between like what people are always saying, Reformed theology and all this, though, is this issue with eschatology but it is such a big and eschatology is the study of end times and the just the end times things okay but it does change a lot of the way you understand teachings a lot of the things that the way that jesus said or a lot of the things that jesus said if you don't understand the difference so so for instance if you're believing on a traditional reform view you're you're referring to jesus is speaking of building this kingdom here and it's going to grow to this big large wonderful kingdom here and then all the enemies are going to be brought under his feet so that this side of it says that yes we are actually going to be playing a part into spreading the gospel to all the nations we will eventually christianize all the nations and bring them under his feet and then christ returns and that's what that side is versus the the dispensational side, which says, no, Jesus was talking to Israel and he's coming back to Israel. But the church right now we're in between, you know, the, the two advents, the first and the second coming. And and we expect this time to get worse, not better. So but that that does change everything. A lot, I mean, in a lot of different ways, it changes the way. It's things that you hear from the pulpit because you're, for instance, like, you know, like Apologia when they're teaching, Jeff is teaching that they go out and they do these March to Life and these wonderful things for abortion, which and there's nothing that I'm saying, you know, absolutely, I still think that we should have. But these are, like John MacArthur even says, these are small victories that we shouldn't think that this is going to to affect the the outcome of the nature of man. But that's what that type of theology pushes that they're doing these things to bet to bring the enemies under Christ's feet and by doing these by standing up the church going and standing up with bullhorns and going in front of 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 con- you know their their local state things that this is how this is happening and this is going to catch on around the world and we're going to forward the kingdom of Christ here that's a very that can be a very very dangerous doctrine because that does that puts your eyes on the cares and affairs of this world and gets it off completely about being a citizenship of heaven that gets you more involved in this i've got to make this mess that i'm in right now it's my job to make this better in a sense that sounds good and that's what we're supposed to do as christians but in the way that they're teaching it is a way of you're actually making a difference 
in the kingdom and making a difference of affecting the return of, of Christ. And that's how they hold to um, the, the hastening the day of the Lord. They're thinking that the quicker that we bring the enemies under his feet, the quicker he's going to come back. Yeah, and, that's, <laughs> and that's, again, taking it too far. Right. Um, and that's where, like I said, it's any of these arguments, we should be willing to sit down, open scripture. And even when I've, when I've listened to uh, Jeff's eschatology, and they did the eschaton series a while back and all that stuff, like he had his favorite text proofs. Oh yeah, and it's like you, the way Psalms. you are arguing arguing for this point is no different than essentially that which the Jehovah's Witnesses do with their proof text or any other cult. And it's like I don't understand how you you see that. It's like you you can't simply pick out a select few verses and essentially isolate them from the text and then say this is what this must mean. Therefore, allegorize them. Yeah, yeah or just you know. Hey, that's oh, this is the only meaning, um, and you anybody who holds to a different meaning is wrong. Uh, well, no. What does the context say? How should this be understood? There's that's why, you know, as we a- answer these questions, uh, especially I love the, the 21 day challenge. A lot of people mm-hmm. have done some amazing. Oh yeah, questions dude, yeah. Been... Uh, you know, sections where I'm like, man, I got to go back and read this over again. Oh yeah, it's, it's, they've it's caught great. me off guard a bunch of times. Yeah, <laughs> it's I'm great. like, Ooh, I was not um, expecting that. Question. But I find like I, I have to go back to the context, and then oh, usually, yeah. if you would just read the context, which is I know like Heidi's big point, like just mm-hmm. you know when we say read the Bible, we don't mean flip open to 20 different verses or have your verse. Right. We mean just read through the text. And then when these questions come up, you should read through the text again and again and do that a couple of times and then go, okay, where else did I read about this in the text? Bible oh, interprets itself here. perfectly. Exactly. And that's where I find a lot of the answers to these questions are simply like, okay, we'll just back up a chapter. What is going sure. on here? Oh, look, this points out essentially lays the foundation or in like in another question I answered, it was, well, who is this talking about? Okay, just back up to the beginning of the chapter. It's talking about false prophets and teachers right here. So when you apply all this and you follow that context, they, 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 it's still talking about them. Um, and so that's, yeah. But no, hey, yeah. you shouldn't get, you know, if, if this becomes your sole focus, yeah, it can be a distraction, right? Should we, do, do I think there's importance in having doctrinal understanding and statements sure um but i think at the same time we all learn and grow right and so if this is a stumbling block for you right because there in a way there is a simplicity to the gospel right and we don't want to you know i can certainly spend a ton of time in this and kind of hash it out but then be so focused on that because like one of the things that they talk about with with those who hold to like the five points of Calvinism, right? They actually say that there's a cage stage, uh, which is hilarious because the whole idea was that, Hey, you just got to these points, but you don't, you don't quite understand it completely. You just now think everybody must know this right now. And everybody who doesn't is wrong and they're all heretics and you're, you're the only one that has it right. And my gosh, are they even saved? Because, Oh man, like I, you just need to go out and correct it. Um, and that's where it's like, no, no, that you, you just to need everybody to be caged a little bit. For a little yeah. bit. Like y- you should not be let out for right now because you're more dangerous having understood some of these points, but you don't understand all of it. Right. And so that's where, you know, somebody like John MacArthur holds the five points. I, I think it's a, when he did a series that I listened to um, at the end, he's like, but listen, all right. If I want to make it simple enough for everybody to understand. And I ask you, okay, uh, who is living your life? And most people would say, uh, I, I, well, I am, right? And he goes, okay, so, or some would say, well, the Holy Spirit is, is living, right? And so he's like, okay, well, when you sin, is that the Holy Spirit? Well, no, that's, that was me. Okay, but when you do something good, is that you? Oh, that's actually the Holy Spirit working in me. It's like, okay, so when you really break it down, it's like there are so many points that we try and define and we want to have just absolute in our minds that this must be this way and it's like you know we 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 get caught up in these points and you know all glory should be given to god in the end and that's why certain like i think what you're getting at is well if you think you can save yourself somehow Mm -hmm. no that's radical right you you can't do it but if somebody who says i hold to a form of grace 
and uh, we recognize it's only through Christ, but hey, my free will is was in choosing that. And, you know, and some would say, well, that's because God looked down the corridors of time and he foreknew that choice was going to happen. Okay, well, you know, I can, I can still say, okay, well, that's what you are, sh you believe. Um, but I'm not going to call you a heretic. I'm going to call you a brother in Christ. Right, so, exactly. Right. You know, and that's where, you know, if I was to then go off the rails and be like, you know what, you're wrong. This is, and no, that's, yeah, that's and then, the point. That's not. Then they always, then they always turn that back. They turn that argument back on to David. <laughs> well, then why? Then he was anointed. He was anointed when he was young, knowing what was going to happen later. Why did God still, it, it, these arguments, they get ridiculous. They get that, then they go. They they go to you know what's funny though too is they like somebody like Durbin, who reform most reform people are, are young earth they're they're young earth creationists they 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 believe in a literal six day cre creation. Okay, so but you interpret you interpret that in a literal sense, but yet you go into Revelation twenty and you don't interpret revelation 20 in a literal sense is the thousand years right the thousand years that's <laughs> right. allegorical right yeah but but it yeah. has in genesis that has to be 100 percent has to be literal that has to be a literal and it is amen i mean i'm not amen yeah i, I mean amen we i'm not denying that at all absolutely it is a it is a literal interpretation of genesis but it's also a literal interpretation of Revelation. <laughs> right, and, and that's, that's and always that's been my argument, is. too, is those who hold to the amillennial or postmillennial view, it's like you have to turn everything into some mystical number, everything. Like, yeah, you can't take ridiculous. anything literal. And, uh, I mean, again, but that's where, like But said, for the reformer, though, I think that's where it's, it's just kind of short circuits because – you're dealing with these things on such just a holy, like, just like a, you know, and this is where it gets kind of scary because you kind of feel like you're on a, like, a, a upper level, you know, where you're just like a, uh, like you said, the cage kind of just prideful stage of it that you're kind of dealing with some of the stuff. And then you're wait, then you're like, wait a minute. But the, then, like, when the rubber meets the road, then you're like, wait a minute, Jesus, Jerusalem, thousand years, Satan really being bound. Like, all these things happening, you know, like, in a literal sense, you're like, wait a minute, that sounds crazy. <laughs> you know, well, it's like hard it's, to to kind of literally believe this, and especially like for a dispensationalist, we would look and go, "Okay, the regathering of Israel in forty eight is interesting because we know that this is only God saying, "Hey, look, I mean, I, I said what I was going to do, and eventually there's going to be a remnant that I'm going to be, bring back to the literal land of Israel that will that will worship the Messiah and then we'll go into the kingdom." And so, you know, we see that and we're like. Oh, wow. You know, that that's, but, but the other side doesn't. So, um, I just thought was, that, that was an interesting, uh, addition to it. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I we, we it. challenge everybody to be Bereans, right? Like we do. that's, that's Amen, the idea. Man. You should never hold up a teacher so high that anything like you, you should, in other words, you should never hold a teacher so high that therefore everything they say is true because they're correct on some points. Sure. Right? That's where we always want to say, all right, go back to the text. Sure. Check everyone and everything you hear against the text. And there are going to be times where, hey, maybe they have an understanding that you haven't gotten to yet. Maybe they're able to harmonize certain things that you haven't to. But at the same time, like the whole eschatology and revelation, I mean, that's where it's like, okay, you're ignoring Daniel mm -hmm. and the times, time, and half the times, which is a literal designation sure. of three and a half years sure. when it gives the days the, the amount of days that that represents right considering a 360 year i mean a 360 day year and so it's like okay so some of these things and dates are literal you can't just turn every number somehow into some yeah you know you spiritual can't. something else right the 144,000 is well that's now the church well, uh, you really got to do some finagling to to change the tribes and then on top of that mention that it's uh men who have never known a woman yeah like <laughs> uh what how does that work for a, a, a woman like what so it's like you, you got to do these gymnastics to make it fit you do right. yeah um and that's usually where okay if a teacher's doing gymnastics around a point or if they say okay it says this here but i'm gonna go jump to some other text somewhere else this one single verse and be like well that must mean this yeah. over here it's like okay 
it should the understanding from the text should fit the context right, right? exactly um and that's a challenge that i think and i find myself too like okay am i understanding this in what this is saying here or am i wanting to grab this verse from a whole nother book and another go author from my and, understanding right, right and be like well that says this and i believe it only it's hard not right. to do that i'll oh, yeah. admit it it is because you yeah. especially when you get worked up about something and you're like man i know he was talking and then you go look you're like that's not in that context i can't that's not what he's saying and he's <laughs> like i can't use that but i want yeah. to yeah. but so yeah i mean it is difficult it is it's important to be a brand and most uh, a lot of people get concerned they're like well I'm so concerned about who I listen to and, and teachers and this kind of stuff. And it's like, I don't want to listen. It's like, listen, in the middle of the road, you have to understand too, back in Jesus's day and, and even the Jews, they had different interpretations of what these things meant. Look at the two groups that after, I mean, this was sure. This was, this was at the beginning, the, 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 um, the beginning of the first century and, and the Pharisees weren't even around until, you know, what, like, yeah, it was it was closer to the 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 Maccabean period that when Correct, the Pharisees yeah. even even started. So, but you had the Pharisees and Sadducees that they completely interpreted it different. I mean, this was your this was your modern day like amillennialist and your your pre tribulationalists almost like because the Pharisees they believed in the literal interpretation of a literal resurrection. This and the Sadducees they didn't. They they believed that you know the soul died along with the body and and all sorts of other things. So there's always been – now there's – those are obviously religious systems that were completely out of hand, but where do you think we are now? I mean this is the exact right. same type of things that we do. We have two different interpretations of, of, of something, and sometimes it, it doesn't matter. But on the extremes of both sides, they go off into just heresy that you can't go to. But what does matter, I think, in, in widening this up is, is just – I think we can agree that just a consistent literal interpretation to these issues is is always the best way to go about any of these things. Don't listen to, you know, don't don't align yourself with with points of, you know, don't put yourself in this box of I'm a five point Calvinist. You know, it's like that. Let's look at this biblically and, and see and see where you fall as opposed to putting this into a, a system. So to speak, even though it's fine to have, um, obviously on on our end of it, these types of systems are very important because these separate many things for us, right? We we can tell the difference between heretics and 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 solid biblical teachers between these types of terms and systems. But um, for the normal person that gets confused on this, um, you know, I, I just say it doesn't. These things really don't matter in the salvational issues, the smaller issues. Correct. Yeah, and and just if you want Not a biblical exactly. example, Peter was used by God uh, the day of Pentecost for three thousand to be saved, um, but then he's being corrected by Paul in Galatians, and later Perfect in his example. writings are saying even Paul he has he is writing scripture essentially that some yeah, he's saying, don't understand. They're hard to some, understand, yeah. but you know those who don't are not believers are twisting it to their own destruction. So there's, you know, what I if if I had only read Galatians two. Would I then go? Well, you shouldn't read the letters of Peter. Right. He's oh, he was he was becoming a Judaizer. Just right. Like, exactly. Like, no, that's not what we're saying. You could do a lot like, with Peter. Pay attention Did and that. lean. What does God's word say? And so, with any teacher, um, you should be able to do this. And if you are struggling, like oh, well, they're saying this thing. I don't understand. It sounds right. You know. Okay. Reach out and read a couple different commentaries. But realize, again. The Holy Spirit will grant understanding, and those that Amen, hold yeah. closest to the text sure. and walk through the text tend to be the right answer. It's when you start going with this crazy gymnastics of yep. we'll pull verse A out of this flips, book yep. and verse B out of this book, and we're going to build a system out of that, and then that must be applied to the... Okay, well, yeah, that's, that's a bit much. Um, a lot of times the understanding is right there in the text, in the context, right? And then it should agree with the rest of scripture. So. It should. Yes, exactly. So, um, I mean, this, that's, that's the way that we deal. I mean, <coughs> and I mean, the, yeah, these little differences, like you said, they don't matter. So the, to, to answer the question directly to the, the, how do we reconcile? Like it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't. And, um, 
you know, we, we just want to stick with the, the, the text and stick in the Bible and, and not go outside of that for sure. So that's when we get in trouble. And you're right. When you don't want to elevate these teachers or these, these people on different platforms to say that, you know, Paul warned of this. I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow the... It, no, none of these guys saved you, and it's that's not the point. None of these doctrinal, you know, Calvinism, it, Cal, he's not the ultimate authority on any of these things. These all, this all belongs to God. These are just, you know, principles. So, um, right. So, agree with Calvin as far as it agrees sure. with Scripture. Yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> like, I mean, that's like exactly. That's, it. There you go. Or uh, agree with any of these guys. Or with any of these. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, you know, Darby Schofield, whoever. You know, uh, uh, Calvin, wh- whatever you want to, those are dispensationalists and Calvinists, but who, who, whichever side that you you stick on, um, we just want to look at to, to Christ. So, Heidi, was there anything else that we needed to hit on? Do you think this is a good conversation? Heidi's our, like, our Jamie right now. Um, some people might get that right. I'm hoping that I think you guys covered everything, hopefully. Okay, because I, I really want to put this issue to bed. You probably created some more questions on I, top of this. I'm sure we, it will continue. We're gonna on. have to. We're gonna this have is to be redo a this. I know we're, this is this is probably gonna be like a 50 part conversation. Probably because, but the the important part is is uh, I mean it doesn't matter. I don't think it matters where either Travis or I stand on. I mean uh, we're not authorities on these issues. Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, you guys see certain things from different angles. Right, Those but things I mean, and they, and they one another. One another. You both know that you are fallible men, sure. and that it doesn't matter what you think and what you say; it matters what Scripture states. And so, at any point, you can be, you know, things can be brought up. You are but, not above reproach, but you can still work together to do God's work, right? Because it doesn't matter. You are not clinging on to a name and a title so tightly that you cannot see anything but the agenda of the movement behind whatever title you're It's just unfortunately that these two systems that we spoke mostly about with this dispensationalism and and reformed or... or You're on. You're still going. Reformed or covenant or whatever. These two things that we spoke about here, um, they, they naturally want to fight each other all the time. They want to argue and tear each other down, which I think it's ridiculous and I don't like that. Yeah. about it because i understand the side the points from both sides of it i understand the covenant the, the covenant theology side and i understand the dispensationalism side sure. and i'm way more on the dispensationalism side but that doesn't mean that i agree with the 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 group over here in the dispensational side that goes and slams the calvinist side yeah because the, 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 you don't go slamming a brother and sister like there are certain things that are damaging like I do truly believe and I know I will scream this until the day the Lord comes but I truly believe that this kingdom understanding and this and this does mean this this Israel the distinguishing between the nation of Israel ethnic Israel and God's chosen people and the church is a major distinction and I will I will continue to preach that until I see Christ again because that's just important to me do I think that's a salvation issue no but but we have to understand that the root of anti-Semitism comes from Satan himself. Mm-hmm. Okay, that Satan has always wanted to destroy the Jew, and he has tried to do that. I mean, look what happened with with the the decree before Christ was born. Of course, we have reasons and and things like that, but we can see that all throughout history, it's it's been this attempt. To destroy and squash the Jew, mm-hmm. and and God has always kept this little remnant of people all throughout history, mm-hmm. no matter what. And when we sometimes on the other side, when we descend, when we say things that were, you know, like these, just th- there have been MacArthur thinks that replacement theology is heretical. Yeah, I agree with right. him. Yeah, I completely agree with him. He said this on with Ben Shapiro. He said mm-hmm. there's a popular teaching in the church a heretical teaching in the church today called replacement theology and i'm like man do you know what calling that a hair i mean that is it i think it is i believe that i believe it is a heresy and but to say that that means that there are some people that are unknowingly teaching it but then there means there are some people that are willingly knowingly teaching it and willingly trying to lead people the wrong way and what does john say 
right? This is this is really important because what we, as we get into these latter days, right? These, this antichrist will this antichrist type spirit will everything will be opposing, but it will be right as you did in your your uh, your teaching on on Satan disguising himself as an angel of light. I mean the the hugeness of that. We're not talking about Jehovah Witness crazy doctrine, okay? We're talking about doctrine that looks a lot like ours, sounds a lot like ours, but is off. Off in the way, and that's why things like this really bother me because I'm like, man, I really see things like what Paul was warning about, what John was warning about, even what Jude was saying, different things like this coming in and attempting to pull this out and elevate this one thing over is like, ah, that seems like something that happened a lot in the Old Testament, and it didn't go well for every time that that happened to any other nation or any other people that tried to do this. Um, you know, I mean, God is, is very, very specific about his people and not forgetting Israel. So that that's just where I think that, that that danger and that part of it can come. And that's where these two sides naturally want to fight. But it, did you have a comment on that? Well, no, I just, um, yeah, I mean, but at the same time, understanding a, a specific viewpoint can lead to heresy, I guess. But at the same time, like, so we would still call Jeff Durbin uh, an apology of church. Brothers in so, Christ, correct, right? But, right. And because correct. what we can see is even in that false term, so their eyes are off Israel as a nation. Correct. Right? They're not expecting Christ to come and gather his people in the clouds right. like the rapture. They're, that is not a part of their teaching, and they essentially teach against it, right? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, they're not ready, and they are. there can be a false expectation of, okay, now if we got to bring about the kingdom, that means God must grant us success, mm -hmm. right? And I can think of that one guy who canoed his way over to that one tribe about a year ago yeah, or whatever, yeah, yeah. and they just shot him. They just shot died. him, yeah. And it's like, well, that's tragic in one, two. His heart was in the right place, right? but... I mean, from an amillennial standpoint, it's like, uh, what happened? Like, God should have granted that success. It's like, okay. Well, Doug Wilson goes, we've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> that's not right. But that's the point is, so any of these systems, it's like, okay, but is that a, like you said, is that a gospel matter in the sense of, are we still not telling people to trust in Christ? No, they, they just like we would say, no, Christ is your only hope. And that's where... You know, their view of um, putting that out and having an importance of the gospel is still there. And they would criticize us. Well, uh, if you think Christ is coming, well, then you're just going to sit around and do nothing and wait for him to return. It's like, well, no, actually, those who still hold to a scriptural viewpoint understand that we are still to be about busy proclaiming the gospel, mm -hmm. right? Right. And, and, and on the other yeah. side of that is what? You're going to go around and proclaim the gospel, this empty gospel that's being proclaimed all across the world? That, you know, we're going to spend five minutes and pray with somebody and ask them to accept Jesus into their heart? That's what right. we're, you know, like, yep. so, but we're, we're making disciples and we're spreading the gospel. But that to that has been dumbed down to going out to the world and going to abortion clinics and going, hey, would you like to accept Jesus in your heart? Okay, give it five minutes. It'll just take five minutes of your time. But because we've got to preach the gospel and make disciples of nations, and I think that's where, like, that's where the the um, you know the the disp or the the, the premillennialists would be like, yeah, that's that that's where this where this this false religion is coming from. This this wet noodle, this elevation type gospel is coming from, is from us thinking that we've got this this oh we got to go spread the gospel, but we don't know what we're talking about. We don't know what right. the gospel is. Well, that's that's in one of uh, the answers I had with one of our fellow members here. Um, you know, it was like, well, I want to I want to pray this person to just accept Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, well, yes, I get sure. your heart, and that's where you should be. Um, but we got to realize too, like even in our, in the nation of America, we now have people that have grown up to have never understood who God is, who Jesus is. Yep. There are people, even um, in the Calvary Chapel side, you know, one of the guys I talked to, one of the pastors, he was talking about, he's like, I actually was witnessing to a guy who literally looked at me and goes, who's Jesus? And you're like, wait, like, you, you don't know? Yeah. Like, it, it, nothing? You don't, mm -hmm. No. Like, what are you talking about? 
That's when so, you're like, man, how do we start from step one? Right. Exactly. <laughs> so that's the point is yeah. we have to remember that, you know, regardless of our viewpoint, regardless of how you want to say how God loves you, whatever, um, you still need the full gospel. Oh, yeah. And making a disciple is making a student. Yeah. Right. That's why. Um, yeah, because with that, you know, who's Jesus is we can, a perfect We can question. look at Billy Graham in almost two lights. Like, oh, awesome, man. He went and did these huge crusades and all this stuff. And so many people came forth and proclaimed right. Christ. And then how many of those actually continued in that? Where thing? is it? Because how that many was it. were that discipled. Was, right. right. And, and, like, and where is it? Do you know if those numbers and for our world today, where is it? Where'd they go? Right. And yet I can tell you that there are some who truly came to faith sure. through that. And my m- my mom anyone. is my mom was one of them, and and, abs- and my my family, my grandpa came to um, saving faith through through his ministry, and everything. so your absolutely. mom sang in his choir and stuff. Yeah, my mom sang in his choir. So absolutely, right. but at the same time, I agree with that one hundred percent. That's one of the things that I have to, and that's where we. And this is an interesting conversation that I'd love to have on a separate thing too, because we as Christians, right? This 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 is what our we, we go out and we preach the gospel, but then we preach it, and then it's, uh, well, who's Jesus? Well, well, what do you mean? You know who Jesus is. He's, oh, you don't know who he is. Oh, so you're right. you got to have the full story. Okay, well, then if, if the whole gospel shows that, okay, well, you're a sinner in, in need of, uh, of a Savior, and, and this is something that you need, you desperately need. Right, and that's that's where even... At the children's home, actually, we had a, a kid essentially profess faith in Christ. Um, and, you know, I pray, God, that that is genuine and stuff. Sure. But he knew nothing. He's like, wait. He, like, the, uh, the conversation opened up after one of the teachings. He literally came up to me and goes, so wait, is heaven for real? Wow. I'm like, Gosh. oh, yeah. Like, that's where God dwells in the fullness yeah. of his presence. And he's like, oh, what does that mean? Oh, wow. Like, I yeah. mean, we had to start from literally scratch. 